Bryce Edwards is joining us, though, to talk about what happened over the weekend at the Labour Party conference in particular, uh, but also um, COP22 or COP27 or COP26 or COP35. What is it? We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Uh, Bryce, good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Morning, Michael. Um, first of all, the Labour Party conference. How did you see that? From an outsider's perspective, it looked quite successful. Well, it's a, it was a very stage managed conference, as most are these days. As they the, all are, the media yeah. were banned from ninety percent of it, and we really just got to see those big set speeches from the the prime minister, the minister of finance, etc. And it really was uh, an electioneering conference, even though it's one year away from the election. And of course, we had one announcement about the those cost of living, family uh, spending um, packages. But overall, I thought it was a very conservative conference and it kind of suggests to me that the Labour Party has become quite a conservative party. We didn't see a lot of radicalism. We didn't really see a lot of left-wing policy or anything, really. And I think that really sums up where the Labour government is at the moment. It's kind of almost as an alternative national government. Um, yes, I've got a few radical things around, you know, say, three waters, uh, reforms of PDNZ and RNZ, but mostly it's all about stability. And so it was quite fascinating to hear the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, just keep on talking about how they're the party of stability, responsibility, balance, and it's the, it's the national party that are the dangerous ones that, you know, that are risky and experienced um, up, up to the challenges of, you know, the, 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 the crises that we're facing at the moment. So, you know, that's a really conservative pitch to voters. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you pitch co-governance as being anything other than radical or hate speech or, as you say, the yeah, that's right. of... No, yeah, that's mm. right. I think, right, those are quite radical things. But overall, uh, you know, I know I'm coming from, you know, more of a left-wing perspective here, Michael, but, you know, this government hasn't been one of great left-wing reforms. It's mostly been status quo, keep things, you know, business, business as usual. Uh, and I think that's part of the electoral problems at the moment. If they had been a bit more progressive, if they had actually implemented things and you know, did big, done big, big things on housing and equality, they'd actually have more support because really they're still pitching themselves as the party of, yeah, kind of stability, uh, middle of the road, uh, conservatism. Yet, if voters really do want a conservative government, they can actually just go for the National Party. That's kind of the original Conservative Party, if you like. And so that's why I think they're really only at 31% in the polls and National keep going up. They're kind of the real deal if you want a Conservative government. Yes, I, I, I'm interested in that view that you've got, though, that this is a Conservative Labour Party. Um, I don't quite see... Well, yeah. yeah, carry on. I mean, it's it's not that they don't have any left-wing policies, any radicalism, but uh, Jacinda Ardern herself and the way that she operates her manner is a very cautious one. It's not one of taking chances. It's not one of, uh, you know, it's, it's managerialism and sort of the way that, um, you know, national prime ministers of old. She's more, you know, holy oak than she is Michael Joseph Savage, in my view. Uh, and that had a certain appeal, especially over COVID, when, and when people wanted some stability, that's why she won over 50% of the population by keeping things calm and things balanced, as she would put it. And I think in 2022, going into 2023, we're having a more sort of polarised time, and she's not really tapping into that zeitgeist, apart from maybe things on Three Waters or something else. But, you know, the people that want a stable government, they've got Christopher Luxon, who's, you know, even more bland than Jacinda Ardern, in my view. Yes, um, it's interesting you say that because uh, Jacinda Ardern is clearly a policy. Um, if anything looks like it's radical or divisive or is likely to upset the horses, Jacinda Ardern doesn't tend to announce it. Uh, that would be left to the minister who's going to announce it, whatever that might be. Uh, Nanaya Mahuta, for example, is often used as a bit of stalking water around um, Three Waters and and, um, and local government changes, etc. But um, 
why has the luster rubbed off Jacinda? Is it because people don't see her as a unifying force anymore? I mean, I know she's still 30% in the polls, but gee, that's almost halved on what it was two years ago. Yeah, I mean, this is this is my view that those that actually do want a left-wing government are quite disappointed by this administration and they see Jacinda Ardern as kind of selling out or being too weak. And those on the right that want, you know, um, a more conservative approach, they have got um, a, a very sort of bland and but conservative option and national now. And so they're kind of falling between the gaps, you know. Um, they're not really enthusing those on the left. They've lost the support of those on the right. Um, and I think it's, a, it's a, a mistake that they are trying to be all things to all people and really failing to be, yeah, much inspiration to anyone. And that's why we got, we've got them last night in the polls at 31%. National keep on going up. And I guess in my view, National is not really offering anything particularly inspiring to anyone either, but at least they're, they're new, they're fresh, uh, they're not the incumbent, and that's their winning formula. Um, now, the other thing that uh, is interesting, for example, is that public health officials, and I've, for example, it's my lead story in my, in my local paper today, is the number of COVID cases are going up again, uh, and some sort of third waves underway. Does the government ever get yeah. back in that space or does it say, uh, no, we, you know, it's all over now, we've just got to carry on? What, what do they do now well, when uh, that happens? Obviously, they've got two big drivers in this area. One is, you know, what is best, you know, for the public? Uh, what's the, you know, science-led approach? And what's the electorally, you know, beneficial approach? And those things, I think, are changing all the time. And, you know, I think ever since the start, the Prime Minister and Labour had actually been trying to, you know, uh, take both of those into account. And at the moment, there's very little public appetite to have a, a strong COVID approach or to take, you know, um, heavy measures. So, you know, and we saw it in the weekend that Labour didn't even mention COVID the whole time, especially, you know, their focus was on all the things they've achieved over the five years. And, you know, I, I think we can all admit that their COVID response, at least initially, was highly successful and um, and that's why they won that last election so strongly. But it's now seen as a bit of embarrassment because subsequent parts of the COVID management were incompetent and you know, unsuccessful that, um, you know, really they don't want to talk about um, COVID and health measures anymore. That just turns people off. So, no, I don't see uh, the government taking any big approaches on COVID anymore, even if those numbers keep going up. Mm. Um, and also uh, this COP, um, I, I've talked about it this morning. Uh, New Zealand heading off to Egypt, or we're there now, I think. Um, we seem to have a slightly schizophrenic attitude on this. There's a, you would have seen commentary over the weekend yeah. about there we are going to this conference, um, telling everybody what we're doing, trying to sort of electrify everything, looking at places like Lake Onslow and, um, and the like. But we're still allowing oil and gas exploration, not offshore, but onshore. Um, do you see that as being contradictory or just being pragmatic? Well, there's always going to be uh, contradictions in climate change policies. It's a hard area to, you know, have a consistent uh, sort of uh, uh, approach to it. And yeah, this this government, you know, wants to get the um, the brownie points for what they're doing, but they also want to keep people on side that are affected by, um, you know, the negative consequences of having to deal with. Um, climate change. So yes, of course they're taking a contradictory approach and um, I, I think that might be also the reason that Ardern is not going to this conference. You know, she's called climate change the you know, what the nuclear free moment for mm -hmm. you know, her generation uh, and there were times when she really wanted to be closely associated with what the government's doing in climate change, less so now. She just wants to send James Shaw there and um, I, I think even in the weekend, climate change wasn't really mentioned much. Um, so no, it's become a bit of an embarrassment, I think. And uh, you know, it, it's again, it's one of those areas that's quite polarised 
with those on the left, particularly activists, feeling that this government hasn't actually done much and is, you know, capitulated really, I think is the view on the left, to a lot of industry and agriculture, whereas those on the right think the opposite, obviously. And it's a bit of a no-win area for this government. Um, they're only alienating both sides the more they talk about climate change. Mm, okay. Um, and I guess looking ahead, though, is Labour savable? So if the polls seem to be uniform, this is the worst poll, uh, the one that we saw last night in terms of spreading a gap between the centre-right and the centre-left. Um, is there anything that you well, think can stop them losing the next election? I tend to think the polls will get worse for Labour. Uh, and you know, it's, it's quite possible we're going to see a landslide victory for National and a total reversal of the 2020 uh, victory for Labour. So you remember it was 50% uh, party vote for Labour, 25% party vote for National. I can definitely see that being reversed next year. Um, but no, Labour's probably doing the right thing from a kind of political science point of view at least, from a you know a electoral point of view, in concentrating their firepower on the dangers of National, of trying to undermine Luxon and, and even Willis, and um, so really they need uh, National to stuff up, make some big mistakes, have some scandals, and that will undermine uh, you know, the credibility of National rather than actually give voters a good reason to vote for Labour. Um, so I think it's going to be a very uh, aggressive uh, relentlessly negative approach really from Labour to try and save themselves. I can't see them um, making m many changes between now and the election. They'll do some tweaking, they'll come up with some new policies, but really it's all going to be about fear and about National and ACT in particular being big dangers and so they have to build them up as bogeymen and so we saw that in the in the weekend with yeah, Robertson really trying to ramp up um, fear about the change of government. Does it work? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to remember yeah. a campaign where fear of the opposition um, outranked um, the desire of a country to re-elect you because you're doing your job well. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I'm just thinking in New Zealand's electoral history about that. Uh, I mean, that's been played before. I mean, Rob Muldoon played that card often. Yeah. He certainly played in, in 84 yeah. when they got thrashed. Um, Labour, Mike Moore played that card before Jim Bolger came in. Um, he was warning about Ruth Richardson. Yep. Mind you, he probably got that one right. Um, yeah. But, yeah. you know, I'm just thinking, well, as a general rule, yeah, but, opposition's don't win elections, do they? And it's it's that's governments right. lose them. And if you lose confidence, the government, that's when the other side wins. Look, it's a, it's a terribly cynical and desperate uh, manoeuvre of incumbents to do. But I, I think they, yeah, w when they're struggling to come up with their own fresh ideas, when they've you know, become exhausted, it just becomes the, the last card to play in the pack. And... Mm. And I think it does work to some extent. Whether it will be enough, um, we'll see. But certainly, you know, um, when National has stumbled and they've had, um, you know, scandals, you know, such as the last election, um, you know, all sorts of personal uh, candidate scandals, um, it really did dent the confidence in people that might have otherwise voted National when they thought, well, maybe... Judith Collins isn't so uh, competent, you know, um, maybe she is an aberration, maybe uh, all these other people aren't ready for government. And so, yeah, it's still the best card I think that Labour can play, even if it is a bit desperate. Mm, okay. All right. Bryce, thank you for joining us and giving your insight on that. Um, that's Dr. Bryce Edwards uh, from the heads of the the Democracy Project. It's a sort of free speech, but also a, more of an overview of democracy, a, a, if you like, an independent analysis of what's going on, um, seemingly constrained, or not constrained, uh, by, yes, anything other than being accurate and obs obs observational.